Okay, great. I'm going to pause the recording after each of you respond. But if you would just uh, respond back with the the answer you think is correct. I see one person has responded, still waiting on the other two. Uh, this is, is from last, this is from last week and from our class. Are we choosing between policies and mechanisms or you want to list the high level and low level? Yeah, I want you to know, I want to know which one is high level and which one is low level. Which one are high level structures? Terms of in terms of the OS structures, resources, methods, and so on, right? Which one is high level and which one is low level? We're talking about policies or mechanisms. We're talking about policies and mechanisms. Okay. Let's pause the recording. Um, So I'm getting a single answer, but you need to designate which one's high level and which one's low level. Okay. I thought I had paused the recording. Um, yeah, we'll edit that out. Alrighty. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Policies are high level. Yeah. In Maya Matthew, um, could you please unmute your mic and help me? Uh... Um, I'm sorry, this is Key Andre. I have to change the name. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. So you're using another screen. All right. So we were just reviewing from last Thursday. Wow. We were just reviewing from last Thursday that um, policies are high level and they're usually between the kernel and the application level or application layer. Uh, so policies would execute in the APIs. Mechanisms would be found, mechanisms would be found in the lower level uh, closer to IO. So somebody remembered, oh yeah, IO has something to do with that discussion. So the hardware, input output level hardware, uh, that is important, right? Um, so mechanisms do engage hardware level input output, uh, but, and, and it sits closer to hardware. So those are low level, mechanisms are low level, policies are high level. All right, any questions about this before we continue with our, our review of operating system uh, structures? No. Okay. Um, 
actually, I think I need to take a screenshot of this now. There we go. All right. So our goal today is to finish the review of operating system structures and then to uh, continue on with uh, an assistance as needed with the solution. I don't know if anybody's uh, struggling with the solution yet, but any time remaining we have uh, with the class, we'll use to uh, share screens and work on uh, any assignments or, or solution uh, challenges. So does anyone have any questions before we start? So you could think of hardware as like the mechanism for that level, and then the policy as like the software for that would be the high level? Uh, yes, so the question was, can you consider hardware to be low level and software to be high level? And generically, yes. Uh, applications, softwares, and users are on the upper uh, high level uh, mechanism, they're high level methods, right? High level structures. So policies implement with through from the, the API level on up to the user, through the application layer to the user. So policies affect applications and users through the API, that's upper level. So when you look at a diagram, hardware is always the lowest level. Physical layer is always the lowest level. So when you think about mechanisms, which one's higher or lower, uh, the mechanisms that are used to exchange input output, uh, to calculate results, to store temporary, um, to store temporary calculations during data processing, that's all low level mechanisms. That's uh, deep inside the kernel and those are privileged layer. We say that this is policies are generally up in uh, ring level three and mechanisms are usually ring level zero. There's, we'll get into that in, the, in a, a future module. You may remember from uh, later last week, we talked about uh, scripting languages. And I told you that I thought Python, you, you need to be very familiar with Linux shell scripting. So shell scripting in Linux is an important uh, skill set. And on the Windows side, you want to know something about batch files, but more so PowerShell. Python is uh, an interesting scripting language that would work either in Linux or in Windows. And I think that's the charm of Python is that you can use it both in a Linux environment and in a Windows environment because these are interpreted as they're run. They run slower, but uh, there's a lot of interesting ways to automate operating systems uh, through scripting languages, right? And that's the important thing to remember about uh, automation in an operating system would be done with scripting, either Python in both shell scripts in Linux, DOS, batch, uh, batch file commands uh, in in Windows or PowerShell. I mean, more recently, PowerShell. So uh, when it comes to programming languages, uh, dealing with the low level part of the operating system, that's done in C and C++. C++. So that's another tipping point. If you're talking about automating an operating system, you're talking about using scripting languages that are interpreted and slower when you're talking about uh, redesigning or recompiling internal components of the kernel or hardware drivers, that's done in C and C++. Um, so it says emulation can allow an OS to run on non-native hardware. Last Thursday, I said, oh, I'm not going to touch that. But Essentially, emulation is a form of virtualization. So I want you to think of emulation as virtualizing different uh, 
hardware components so that the operating system can run on different types of hardware. That last point needs to be restated more so like I just shared. So an operating system is going to virtualize hardware components so that, so that an operating system can run on more than one platform. Unless it's a finely tuned operating system like the Mac OS, which only runs on Macs. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, I can get a Mac OS to run on my Windows laptop uh, as long as enough of the components are close to a Mac Pro or a Mac, a MacBook. But uh, that's pretty hard to do, and you have to violate the license agreement for use of the use of the operating software. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, any questions about programming and scripting and platform implementations? Remember that, according to Gaddis, Tony Gaddis, an operating system isn't just it's not just the operating system, it's a set of utilities, and then it's the uh, programming platforms that are used to support. Now, very low level, closer you get to the hardware, you're dealing with assembly language. So, um, I think we called this out. Pretty sure we covered this uh on thursday but we were running a little short on time uh, general purpose operating systems like linux and windows and and the mac os x are very large programs and their general purpose meaning the expectation is you can run a variety and wide range of applications um you can basically so Windows was built on top of something called MS-DOS, but over time, it, uh, MS-DOS was retired. This slide should read abstraction. So um, a general purpose operating system would be layered. And we've been talking about layers uh, along the way, the user layer at the very top, the application layer is closest to the user. The operating system sits between the application layer and the hardware layer. The important thing to understand is that there's two schools of thought about the kernel. Um, a micro kernel, it's called the mock kernel, is considered to be more efficient and higher performance if, if it's used in the context of a general purpose operating system. Um, the practice in industry is to, is to uh, create what's called a monolithic, monolithic kernel with general purpose operating systems. Monolith meaning uh, it's just this massive kernel that covers every need, the application needs, the hardware needs. It's just a very large uh, kernel. So a lot of a lot of the internals of an operating system are, are, are uh, structured as a part of that kernel. That's a monolithic kernel. Microkernel doesn't include hardware functions, doesn't include uh, the hardware abstraction layer, which is the, the layer below the kernel that, that interfaces between the hardware uh, components and the kernel. Um, you don't see microkernels in real life. Uh, the things to remember about this, this almost needs to be highlighted in yellow with a disclaimer that says microkernels are not commonplace for general purpose operating systems, monolithic instead. Any questions about um, the overall structure of an operating system? So here the author is going to look at each of the each of the different types, you know, um, MS DOS, Unix, and then and then uh, layered, right? So you have applications, and then you have this resident system program. The equivalent in modern terms would be a service or a process that's running. So things that are running in resident memory in DOS, DOS can only allow one thing to happen at a time. 
So if you're juggling tasks in DOS, you have to keep um, you have to keep that task that you were working on um, in a in a holding pattern, and those that's done through resident memory. So um, yeah, they're not. There were a lot of limitations with DOS. The levels of functionality are not well separated. The thing to remember is that it's a very limited, MS-DOS was a very limited and very simple structure that didn't isolate um, components very well. And then you have uh, Unix, which was the other flavor of operating system historically. Um, and Unix used uh, specialized hardware. Um, there were very large systems. And so they were able to specialize the structure of, of an operating system and make it very large and very robust. But the catch is you had to buy their hardware. So does anyone ever remember um, a movie called Jurassic Park? Yeah. OK. So Jurassic Park was created, the first Jurassic Park was there was a lot of animation, uh, CGI, computer generated uh, animation. And one of the platforms that was very famous for doing this was a, a company called Silicon Graphics, right? So you'd have these, these special effects uh, workstations that ran Unix back in the day. And Silicon Graphics created uh, a, a, a version of Unix called IRIX. I-R-I-X, had to do with image processing. So it was very specialized when it came to generating, you know, custom uh, images for special effects in, in cinema. And, and so you have all these different flavors. AT&T had a version of Unix. IBM had a version of Unix called AIX. Um, there was an independent company that, that created Unix so that if people wanted to have Unix, they could run it. It was called SCO Unix, Santa Cruz Operations. Um, there were a lot of different flavors of uh, Unix and one of the largest is now owned by Sun OS. So the Sun operating system was a, a network based. So when the internet started to hit it big, there was a company called Sun Sun Computing, and they competed with Microsoft for a time and created a Unix operating system called the Sun OS. That's been purchased by a mega billionaire by the name of Larry Ellison, who owns Oracle. And so uh, that was used to help set up much of the early internet, uh, DNS machines, uh, DHCP and web servers for all running Sun. Sun operating system, but you had to buy their hardware. So you had all these special processors and Sun created their own processors, their own hardware called Spark. It's called a Spark processor and it ran Sun OS. It wouldn't run, wouldn't run other flavors of Unix. So you couldn't, if you liked something in Silicon Graphics and you wanted to port it to your web page, you couldn't just take something from the Silicon Graphics world and IRIX and then move it into uh, the other. To resolve this matter, the industry came up with a standard called POSIX. Uh, we'll see something about this in a little bit, but basically they all got together and decided that they were gonna have certain standards for file system structure and for the operating system components so that uh, operating systems could interoperate. Uh, you could, could exchange files and you could communicate and network with systems even though they were uh, using a different operating system. This was really crude and only partially successful. POSIX compliance, although it was considered a government standard in order to be you know, qualified to be a government system, didn't really uh, get very far. In, in, in reality, right? Um, you see here, Unix, it, you know, much more complex, much more robust, much more expensive, okay? So when we're talking about MS-DOS, uh, 
we're talking about 25 years ago, owning an IBM personal computer or a compatible computer that ran MS-DOS. And it would cost you between $2,000 and $4,000. In, uh, in the rest of the computing world 25 years ago, as operating systems were evolving and being developed, uh, in the Unix world, you had to buy a platform that often costs twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars just for the hardware, and the operating system licenses were anywhere from fifteen to twenty-five thousand. So call it fifty thousand and higher. Fifty thousand dollars versus three to four thousand. Who do you think won the war in sheer economic terms and numbers based on that comparison? And what does MS stand for? Microsoft. Microsoft, Disk Operating System, DOS, right? Okay. That's just additional information in case you were curious. All right, traditional Unix uh, system structure. Let's do this though. I, I really need to capture this, update this again. Hang on just a moment. So any questions at this point? No questions. No questions. Yeah, no. So here you have the users and then you have uh, users working in a command environment. So both MS-DOS and Unix were originally non-GUI. GUIs didn't exist. Nice little icons and clicks. We did say that there was a company you wouldn't suspect was responsible for developing the GUI environment. Can anyone remember who it was? Xerox. Xerox, yes. At their Palo Alto Research Center, which is in the bottom neighborhood, the southernmost, one of the southern neighborhoods of the, <clears throat> actually Park might be closer to San Francisco. It's part of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto Research Center, where Xerox said, hey, th th these commands are just too tedious. And, it, you know, we want our users to be able to do far more with copier machines than just make a single duplicate of a single page. So let's make it easy. And they came up with uh, the GUI. But before then, you had uh, shells and command interpreters. The whole point is, is that sitting between the users and the operating system was something called a command interpreter, CLI, command line interpreter, CLI. Um, and that's where the command line interface or command line interpreter, that acronym came from, CLI. You'd have system calls to the kernel and then lower level stuff. See device down here where you see device input and output, terminal controllers, that means keyboards. Nobody had mice, just keyboards. Then you had physical memory, right? So other than the CPU, you see the components for uh, von Neumann down here, $50,000 components. They say that if if uh, cars had progressed like computers over the last 25 years, you could now buy a Lamborghini for 25 cents and it would run a million miles on a single gallon of gas. That's how you would compare the progression of technology against the automotive industry, right? So here's this layered approach. And I've been talking about layer zero. So layer zero, whenever you're talking about uh, ring zero or layer zero, I want you to think ring. Hardware is right at the center. Ring zero is hardware level. It's very privileged. Uh, if you are not careful about controls to the hardware, you can create a traffic jam. This is where most computer crashes occur. And it's also why applications are not allowed to operate on the layer, on the lowest layer, right? They have to, they have to basically process each of their multitasking requests around that 
single instance of hardware so that they can be uh, coordinated and juggled efficiently. We're used to seeing ring three when you get to application. So ring zero is the most privileged level of operations. So layer zero or ring zero, most people call it ring. I don't know why our author is using layer. Application layer is ring three, okay? And I guess you, I guess the author is saying, hey, there ought to be more layers beyond three because you have cloud now and you have these networked operating systems. So a networked operating system like Windows Server might be ring four or layer four, and then the cloud would be ring five or layer five. Pretty much, I'm pretty certain that's what, uh, what the author is implying in the latest edition is that there's more. In practical terms, when you see operating system development occurring, it's, it's either ring zero or ring three. They're thinking about the hardware versus the software. It's a very kind of a bipolar world, almost binary world. You don't see a lot of references to layer two or ring one, none of that. Uh, operating system development, people are largely concerned with everything that happens between ring zero and ring three. A stable operating system is con considered to be an operating system that only allows applications to interact with ring three or layer three application layer, right? And so there's a modularity, you know, there's a meaning you can kind of bundle concepts and, and uh, privileges together. We've already said, what do we find at layer or ring zero? Do we find policies there or do we find mechanisms there? Mechanisms? Uh, mechanisms, right. Think, think of the word machine and mock and mechanism, right? Kind of similar, microkernel. So we talked earlier about the microkernel system structure. It moves as much out of the kernel into the user space. The idea is, okay, the kernel is privileged. Ring zero is super privileged. So uh, we're gonna keep as little in that ring as possible. And uh, basically this whole idea of the early stages of um, Unix, in fact, it was Minix. Minix uh, was a was a special version of Unix that that had a microkernel, a true microkernel, and it was so partly based on Mach, this operating system development that occurred in uh, Silicon Valley about 25, 30 years ago. Message passing. So a lot of uh, functional methods. You have functions with parameters. Everybody's familiar with functions and parameters and how the parameters are passed on to the next, arg you know, the arguments are passed on to the next function, right? Yes? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So all of that was uh, part of the evolution where um, there's a lot of messaging going on between the layers and levels of an operating system. And this is one way to isolate a lot of the functions for the operating system in a microkernel architecture. Um, so there were supposed to be, some, in theory, there were supposed to be some benefits. It's easier to extend or develop a microkernel, port the operating system in new architectures because there's so little in there. You don't have to worry about uh, doing all that. In theory, that's what they're saying. In practice, that's not how it's turned out at all. Everybody throws everything into the kernel, including the kitchen sink. That's called a monolithic system. And most general purpose operating systems are nothing at all like a microkernel system. So you're learning about, you're learning about the nature of operating systems as they might exist in a unique and specialized environment like the National Laboratories of the United States of America. Lawrence Livermore, um, Los Alamos, Sandia National Labs, right? Um, 
performance overhead for user space. So one of the disadvantages of having a microkernel operating system is that if you have a lot of user and a lot of applications interactions, if it's a multitasking environment, the microkernel is not very good for that. So what's a microkernel ideally suited for? Firmware, specialized purpose operating systems where there are not multiple users. It's not a generalized environment. I want you to think firmware really is an ideal kind of, and they call these embedded systems, right? Kind of makes sense that smaller embedded systems, embedded meaning the operating system and technology is embedded in a simple device and it's connected. Makes sense that a basic device that doesn't have much power, doesn't have much CPU, doesn't have much RAM would also require a smaller kernel. So that's uh, something we want you to understand in terms of the spectrum. As soon as you get into general operating systems, general purpose operating systems, you have to have a whole lot more uh, hardware involved. So there's, there's very few components of a microkernel other than memory management, inter-process communication, and CPU scheduling, and that's it. And that's microkernel. Most everything else that's needed to run that system is found in the user mode. Any questions? Thing to remember about microkernel is it has very little in the kernel, right? Memory management, CPU, and then inter-process communication. Almost looks like uh, von Neumann's diagram, doesn't it? All right, moderating modern operating systems implement loadable kernel modules. In the Windows system, these are these are hardware level drivers. The hardware, like uh, RAM, let's see, memory drivers, um, hard disk controller drivers, chipset drivers, those all bolt onto the kernel of the operating system, and LKM is a acronym, Loadable Kernel Modules, LKM, Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux, R-H-E-L, is the one Linux that really plays up LKMs, okay? So, so what are we saying? In the Linux world or Unix world, if you want to read up more on LKMs, that's something that is is really more commonplace in the Linux or Unix world, LKMs. So, right. And then Red Hat, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, R-H-E-L. And this is, Red Hat is the hybrid flavor of operating systems. You're not paying for the operating system, you're paying for support. And once you have a support contract, then you have an active license to use Red Hat. And it's huge, you can fine tune. So you can basically say, okay, I wanna run Linux and I want it to run a very massive web server. I want a very high speed, high performance web server. I want a very high speed, high performance streaming media server because I'm Netflix or I'm Hulu. I want a hugely uh, highly tuned, massive server that does uh, network uh, security, right? And so you can basically uh, change the nature of the kernel by just applying kernel modules and then recompiling the operating system. And, and then the, the kernel of the operating system is specialized for that given purpose. So when you see LKM, that's really the realm of Linux. Now, what is the LKM? What's the equivalent of an LKM in Windows, right? Well, Microsoft is trying to close the gap because Linux is getting much better and they're free. And a lot of people are using Linux now. So, It's actually these, these uh, drivers, right? They're, they're hardware level drivers, right? 
And I think if you go digging in there, what you'll find is that they don't, Microsoft doesn't really have LKMs. They have hardware level drivers for individual components. And that, that provides efficiency. So if you have a massive server that does networking and uh, it's, it helps organize the network for an entire Fortune 500 company on four continents in 26 countries, that thing's got uh, network drivers that are so finely um, compiled that when they're installed, the hardware level hardware level drivers have to be signed. Okay. In Windows 10, you don't have to worry about it. But driver signing is a big deal. You're modifying the kernel of the operating system when you apply a hardware level driver to an operating system to enhance the performance of the OS for a given piece of hardware. If it's massive, you know, if it's a storage area network or a, a NAS, it's a network attached storage, something very large. Um, and specialized, if, if, if you load that driver and change the internals of the kernel, then hackers love that capability. The only way to prevent hackers from modifying your kernel is to sign the drivers, digitally sign the drivers with a certificate so that Windows says, oh, I see you're actually the Broadcom, you're actually the 3Com, you're actually the Intel driver that I need for this chipset, right? So when you're on the server level for an operating system, you have to sign those drivers because you're modifying ring zero, basically, okay? You don't have LKMs, you have signed hardware drivers. So a driver is a software component that bridges the gap between a hardware component and the API applications need to take advantage of that hardware. Any questions about the Windows equivalent? I keep filling in the gaps here because the author is like a real big Linux nerd. He's a real big Linux guru. And he's, he's very, uh, has, a, has a, a spectacular reputation in the industry. But basically um, he's all about Linux. Right. When it comes to when it comes to Windows, you're not going to find a lot in our textbook about Windows, which is why I keep having to fill in the blanks. So the Solaris, Sun Solaris, Solaris is the commercial name of the Sun operating system. Solaris modular approach, they have uh, components, basically. So they have a core kernel and then they have these different modules, loadable modules, right? So they're so the KLM concept is consistent for every flavor of Linux, but not so much for Windows. It's a signed driver that modifies the kernel for a Windows server. So everybody got that? So that's the only thing you remember from the last 15 minutes. That's an important one. So hybrid systems, a lot of people would call Windows Server to be a hybrid system, uh, a lot of Linux systems with GUI environments and the Mac OS X, they call them hybrid because they're not, they're not micro kernels, they're not monoliths like a, a large data center, but um, they kind of sit halfway in between, right? So the mock microkernel and BSD. BSD is a huge name in Unix and Berkeley um, or Debian. So if you've heard the, the term Debian, uh, Debian basically borrows a lot of concepts from the operating system from BSD. So if you're looking at a pure operating system, uh, from the very origins of Silicon Valley and, and Unix and Linux, that's BSD. And then as the Linux world became, uh, started to evolve, Debian 
became sort of the Linux flavor of BSD. Has everyone heard of the, has everyone heard of Debian? Yeah, you made us install it for um, a class once. Yep. Yeah, Debian. So that's, that's an interesting uh, topic, right? So, and then BSD and where the origins are. You could just type in how are Debian and BSD related, right? And you, you, depending on what kind of uh, response you get back from your particular Google profile, you might get very uh, well-informed sources or you might get some people who are very misinformed about, about that whole thing, right? So Debian and BSD and the differences. So BSD is Unix, old school, original Unix. Linux is the new flavor of Unix that Linus Torvalds created. He wanted people to have free access to a Unix-like operating system and he gave it away. So he licensed it under the, the GNU or new, right? It's called GNU. These are open license, open source uh, licensing, free. GNU means free. All right. And so NU, not Unix. <laughs> there's there's a, some funny acronyms that uh, people have been throwing around for years. Folks that love Unix like to make mention of the fact that uh, GNU is not, Unix is not free. That's one big thing we want to establish right now. BSD is is, is uh, firmly rooted in the Unix world. That is not free at all. Those are fifty. Those are still fifty thousand dollar machines. Linux is the free version, the yeah, free implementation of that that was uh, fashioned after Unix, and and uh, released to the open public, right? Uh, let's see. All right, let's get back into here. A lot of people would argue that Windows is a hybrid environment, um, but Windows Server is really more of a monolithic kernel. It's not a hybrid. It's uh, larger Linux server models are monolithic as well. Microkernel really doesn't um, really doesn't exist in practice, right? So even for Macs, where this, the hardware is tightly defined, can't run Macs on anything other than Mac hardware. The operating system is so tightly designed. One thing that I will tell you that most people don't realize about Macs and, and what advantage they bring to the table. Because Mac developers create an operating system for a specific set of hardware mixes. You have a Mac mini, you have an iMac, which is basically a Mac built into a large screen. And then you have, uh, you only have four or five models. Is everybody familiar with the models of Mac systems? What is it like Pro Air? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Standard? Yeah, you have a MacBook, you have a, you have a very thin MacBook called a Mac Air. You have um, a MacBook Pro, which is the MacBook on steroids. And then, mm -hmm. and then you just have Mac Pro, which is a workstation. And then you have um, the Mac mini, right? So there's all together, there's four or five models. That's it, iMacs, right? So an iMac is a large screen that's got a Mac built into the display. So it's all screen for graphics designers and stuff like that. One thing about Macs is that their developers have done such a good job with the hardware components. The fastest computers, if you want to run Windows better than any other 
platform, use a Mac. Now, I will say that if you have a specialized gaming system, you could probably do better than a Mac, but in just general purpose, if you wanna run Windows better than other brands, buy a Mac and then wipe out the Mac OS and install Windows and use their hardware drivers. The Mac developers have such tight control over the hardware, they, they finally tune the hardware drivers like no one else. So if you're running Windows on a Mac, it smokes most of the other competition, except for very high-end gaming platforms. I just thought that would be worth mention. So if you, if you want something for development in the Windows environment, get a Mac and everybody will look funny at you. And they're like, what are you doing? And you're like, oh, I didn't keep the OS. <laughs> I blew the OS up. Yeah, I don't, I don't mess with that. So, yeah. So here's a hybrid, right? So instead of having three components in the kernel, right? They have this mock kernel, which was supposed to be a micro environment, but then they have this BSD, um, this large BSD component, which has hooks out here to the application layer and the GUI, right? And then you have uh, input output and kernel extensions down to the hardware. It's kind of a, this BSD component kind of mucks up the, the, pure, the pure nature of a micro kernel. So in simple terms, Mac OS tends to be more efficient uh, than other operating systems when it comes to running on their custom designed hardware. Uh, but it's not a micro kernel either. If you talk to people in the Mac world, even some of the Genius Bar people, you go to a Mac store and talk to the Genius Bar, they're not, they're not the brightest bulbs in the cabinet. No, sir. Nope. There are some things they don't understand about the file system. They don't understand its roots in Linux. And uh, they say, oh, no, it's not Linux, it's Unix. Y yeah, not really either. I mean, it is and it isn't. So... It's, uh, it is hybrid. That's a great way to depict a Mac operating system. Just remember if you want the highest performance for a Windows environment, get a Mac. And then they also have something called Bootcamp where you can set up, um, you can run your Mac OS, but then you designate most of your hard drive for Windows and it sets up a huge partition. You can multi-boot into either the Mac OS or the Windows environment, and that's the best of both worlds. You just pay dearly for it. Has anyone priced a Mac lately? One of them going for like up to $2,000, I think, with an M1 chip. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not uncommon to spend $2,000 and higher. You can get a Mac Pro starting at like 4000 and you can spend up to $20,000 on a Mac Pro. But man, is that a machine. The CPUs and the amount of RAM and the graphics uh, built into that, it's like a silicon, it's basically ideal for uh, AI special effects and all that. That's why uh, Macs have, have taken up with the artistic and artisan crowd very, uh, very well. So iOS, right? iPhone and iPad, these are devices, mobile devices. I would argue that iOS development and uh, the thing I want you to understand is that iOS is very much a hybrid in the sense that the processors that are running on mobile devices are RISC processors instead of CISC processors. So when you're talking about Windows or Linux or Mac, you're dealing with a CISC processor versus a RISC processor. That means that there's a reduced instruction set, but you have so many cores in your mobile devices now that, that um, even though it's a risk processor, it's still very good at juggling a wide variety of tasks and applications. You can't say because it's a risk processor that you can't handle general tasks anymore. 
Um, yeah, they're so they're they're covering some comparisons here. The thing I want you to understand is that arm is a reference to risk. That R and arm has to do with reduced instruction set, right? So if you see risk, or, does everybody know what I mean by risk? Everybody remember CSC 241, risk versus CISC? Are these are chips that are more common in phones? Yes, these are chips that come in phones and tablets. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea was, hey, they, they have uh, smaller batteries and they don't have as much power. They don't have as much memory. Uh, sure, we can juggle tasks, but not not to the extent that a full blown laptop or a PC can, right? So that's that's the idea. Um, I would I would say that's <laughs> that's no longer the case. I you can take an iPhone or a Samsung uh, and do amazing things with video and graphics natively on that platform now. So. Everything's becoming blurred. I would argue that the iOS is every bit as robust, but the, the trick is it's very efficient and it has multiple cores. And it's because of the reduced instruction set that it, you know, it can it can do as much in as limited an environment. The future of CPUs is going in the risk direction. And Intel recently announced that they will be decommissioning or deprecating production of CISC processors, except for specialized data centers, like the kind you see in supercomputers, right? Supercomputing applications and data centers, except for that. And that's huge. When Intel says, you know what? Uh, we're not gonna do Intel i9, we're not going to do Intel i7 anymore. We're not going to do Intel i5 anymore. AMD isn't going to do, you know, they're not going to do the Threadripper anymore, right? Why? Well, because everybody's going smaller and lighter and they want to be able to do more with their mobile devices. And this is really the future. So the operating system world is evolving rapidly around RISC processors and ARM processors, which is, my segue to talk about the Raspberry Pi, the processor built into a Raspberry Pi 4 right now is, is so capable. Um, it rivals an uh, Intel i3 in terms of, um, and I know some Intel people would be doing backflips and saying, oh, that's not true. But, oh, uh, all right, so it rivals an Intel Celeron or an Intel Pentium, those are still CISC processors. So what are we saying? The ARM processor that comes with a Raspberry Pi 4, uh, I don't know, just for giggles here, I wanna see what this is, right? It's a Broadcom quad core ARM processor, 64 bit system on a chip, which means that it includes wireless Wi Fi, right? Graphics. When you have a system on a chip, the, that, that processor includes the separate components, the, data bus uh, controllers on the motherboard, all of that's built into the chip. The entire system is on a single chip and it's ARM, right? And so that's, that's a risk chip, reduced instruction set chip for 35 bucks. Once again, you could buy a Lamborghini for 25 cents and uh, drive it for a million miles on a single gallon of gas, All right? We're going to finish out the slides. I'm gonna update 
the study guide and then before our next class you'll need to log your first attempt of the module one assessment okay got it Android. All right. So Android is a variant of a Berkeley, right? No, Debian. Android is a Debian. Uh, it's a Linux based kernel, but modified. So it's a specialized Debian kernel. And uh, it, it is a hybrid system also and works well with risk processors, Snapdragon and such, right? Um, so you do have uh, a very robust environment. Um, this is something that's new, right? Web browser, database, and multimedia, right? So you can actually get into some, some uh, you can develop data applications for these uh, platforms. Right? And they make a Java machine, right? A VM, Apple doesn't. <laughs> Apple iOS. There, there's a kind of a love hate relationship between uh, Java and Apple, but uh, Android is a friendlier environment for developing Java. You probably already knew that. This is a big deal. Power management for mobile devices, right? At the top, you still have applications. What do all these models have in common? At the bottom is the hardware. At the top is the application with the user. And in between sits some manner of kernel components. That's what's common among them all. Um, this is a little bit like the micro architecture, um, micro kernel architecture in that you have a lot of low level libraries in the API that sit alongside the kernel components, right? So one of the favorite things that happens with operating systems, everybody's favorite topic is a crash or the blue screen of death. If an operating system is capable of debugging errors, it has to be able to store or dump files and uh, in this case that's done with the page file system it's temporary uh, memory system and more importantly you have to be able to audit or log so auditing and logging capabilities are huge when it comes to debugging features if you can't log and audit the processes that are running, what kind of memory address ranges they're using. You can't really figure out, okay, why did this crash? And, oh, well, this knucklehead developed an application that uses the same memory address range as a video card. So when you load the application, the screen goes blank. It's happened, right? So Kernighan's law, debugging is twice as hard as writing the code in the first place. Therefore, if you write the code as cleverly as possible, you are by definition not smart enough to debug it. We call that a catch-22. That's a bonus question on your assessment. What's another uh, phrase to describe Kernighan's law? Well, if, if you write an operating system that's good enough for you, you don't have to debug it very much, then you're not smart enough to debug it. Well, I would rather that you create an operating system that has fewer bugs. Um, but you, but the, the truth is there's so much going on with so many different applications. You have to have logging and audit capabilities and you have to be able to store temporary files as those services and processes are running and they have to be dumped to something in case they crash so you can go back and analyze that you when you're when you're uh when you're doing a core dump that means you're capturing the memory the contents of memory the thing we want you to understand about this slide is the inter the, the dependency on system auditing and logging 
right? And that ties back to the file system. The file system has to have logging and, logging and auditing capabilities, but then you also have to be able to capture what's going on. And that's where the page file memory is so useful. There's a specific file that you access when you get a blue screen of death in Windows and it dumps the core of the memory that when they say core dump, they're talking about the contents of RAM and, and the contents of some of the registers uh, in the CPU. Any questions about what we mean by a core dump and how it helps with debugging? So we can analyze, okay, which processes were running, what address ranges were they using, what calls were they making? Oh, this application was making an unauthorized call to a piece of hardware. It wasn't playing nice with others. It caused the OS to crash. When it crashed, it took all the contents stored in memory and dumped it out to the page file before it died. Sometimes a crash is so bad, it won't dump the core. That's, that's, uh, that's real bad. All right, performance tuning. If you haven't become painfully familiar with this, you're not doing a whole lot with your programming degree career path yet. Uh, but if you get into performance, you should be able to see what's going on in your system. And in particular, you're going to look at processes and applications that are taking up lots of CPU and lots of memory. Page file use is very helpful. We were just talking about the page file. This is temporary RAM storage on your system. You have to provide a means of communicating, um, computing and displaying uh, different metrics in the system. So for example, the top program or Windows Task Manager. In Linux, you have a command called uh, top that allows you to display the top consumers of network bandwidth and RAM usage and CPU cycles and so on. That's where the reference to top is, is uh, enclosed in quotes. So once again, he's showing a Windows screen, but he's using a Linux term. I'm like, okay, all right, I can see why this, uh, yeah. I'm gonna stick with the textbook the way it is because it's still the most comprehensive, but uh, we did stop using Microsoft uh, references last season because we wanted people to learn more about the mobile and device computing environment and more about Linux and more about the OS, a Mac OS. So in the Linux world and the Unix world, you have uh, utilities, but you don't have graphical tools to work with. One of the best tools in the Windows environment is something called sysinternals. We're gonna spend uh, quite a bit of time on sysinternals. That's the Windows equivalent of DTrace. Um, so DTrace is used in the Linux world and Unix world to help you troubleshoot and debug why crashes are occurring. In the Windows world, it's sysinternals. DTrace in Linux, sysinternals. Everybody got that? Um, so operating systems are designed to run on any class of machine. The system must be configured for each computer site. SysGen program obtains information concerning. So th this is uh, this is an this is an operating system design um, design utility. I'm not as familiar with this um, SysGen, but basically I. From what we're seeing here, uh, if, if you want to fine tune or design a specific kind of operating system, this is one resource you have. Um, so that's useful information. System boot. Okay, so let's take uh, just one 
uh, the, the remaining time to talk about booting up a system. We have one minute left to talk about system boot and then we're done. Uh, any questions before we talk about booting a system? No. Okay. No questions. You start up a computer, you have to load some things out of the disk. That means there's some basic there's some basic read-only memory or firmware that's burned into a chip called a BIOS chip. And it allows your operating system to make initial calls. The first thing that happens with a system startup is a, the bootstrap loader. This is an operating system component. It's the first one to load out of ROM or e, EEPROM. And it knows where to go to find the boot block on the hard disk. So if I ask you, is the bootstrap loader stored on a chip or is it the first thing to read out of the hard disk? What are you gonna say? Um, that is stored on a chip. It's stored on the chip, right? All right, now there's a trend now that has to do with UEFI. It's a, it's a way of updating how BIOS and the boot ROM works so that it's less susceptible to hackers. And in that case, some of the bootstrap code is actually stored on the hard disk in a special partition that does not have a drive letter or file system access. Um, so that would be a new exception to this uh, particular statement here. But in a traditional computer system or laptop, your, your BIOS chip would help locate where to look for the OS startup, the main boot record, MBR and the boot block, right? And in Linux, a common bootstrap loader, Grub, is um, one of the first things to load as a Linux system starts. And then the kernel loads, and then the system is running. OK? So in order, a bootstrap loader helps identify the main boot record, or MBR, which in the Linux world is called the boot block, a common name for the uh, bootstrap loader in Linux is called Grub, but Grub does not exist in Windows. Hang on a sec. Ah. Okay. Any questions before we clear for the day? So first boot First, first the bootstrap loader, then the MBR, right? The main boot record or boot block. It's the first, first uh, boot sectors that load the operating system kernel where the operating system kernel components are stored. And then, then the system is up and running and other applications run the GUI loads, all that, right? The, when the GUI screen comes up, that comes after the kernel. So just, just remember that order. That's it for our review of operating system structures, part two. Um, as I said before, we'll update the study guide and uh, put it out there for you. And you need to attempt your first module one assessment before start of class on Thursday at, 12, at 11 o'clock. Any questions before we close? Mm -hmm.